Welcome to Hub City Vineyard Church Online. If this is your first time, welcome. If this is not your first time, welcome back. If at any point during this service, you feel called by the Holy Spirit to make a change in your life, simply text change me to 97000 and someone from our church staff will reach out this week. And to find out more about our community of faith, check us out online at hcv.church. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. We're so happy to have you here this morning. We love you so much. If it's your first time here, or if it's your 80th, 800th time here, we're so happy that you're here to praise and worship with us this morning. Just turn around to the person next to you, give a quick high five, say, I came here to worship. Now go on the other side. Yeah. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything.
Hey, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Good. So good to see you all. If you join us from home, your dorm, your car, wherever you may be watching, thank you for welcoming us into your space. So uh, today we are continuing our series right on the money. And for the month of February, we've been discussing Jesus's words on money and possession. So if you're new here, first time here, please don't check out. We love you. This is going to transform your life, I promise. We kicked off week one with a talk on giving and what it is and isn't and what the word actually means to our life. Last week, we looked at putting God first with our finances and our money and Jesus's thoughts on tithing. If you want to go back and listen to any of those, you can go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, and listen in. Now, to start today, if you have a dollar in your pocket, not too many people carry around cash anymore, but if you do, take it out and hold it up so that everyone can see. Okay, I have a dollar. If you have a dollar, please take it out. Now, I want you to look at it, and I want you to read, I want us all to read together the phrase that Congress decided to print on all of our U.S. currency. Are we ready? In God we trust. That's right. In God we trust. Now, this is a complete contradiction because as a nation, we say in God we trust, but our actions and behaviors as a society reflect that we put our trust in everything but God. Specifically, we put our trust in money, We put our trust in our resources. We put our trust in our government. And for many of us, we put our trust in our own abilities to be successful and to have success in this life. This week, I felt like God challenged me to get practical and to actually align our money to our mouths and put our actions there as well. That that putting our trust in God is, is simply making a choice to do what our currency already states, that in God we trust. So today we're going to discuss a simple statement that says, act your wage. Act your wage. And for many of us, we have always acted our age, but, but a lot of us haven't always acted our wage. And, and this is very true because we live in a society that teaches us, and not only teaches us, but invites us to aspire to acquire. That the bigger is better, and, and that is the American way. Less is definitely not more. If I currently have an iPhone 13, hey, it's time to upgrade because the 14 is faster, bigger, and takes better pictures. Three bedrooms is not enough. Why not upgrade to four bedrooms? Then, hey, you don't have to pay for a storage container. Minivans? Really? Who drives a minivan? Have you heard about the luxury SUV? I mean, don't miss out. Go and get it. And everyone needs a vacation every single year. If you have children, right, Disney offers all kinds of vacations. You can go on a cruise. You can go to Disneyland because that's where dreams come true. And don't worry about the money if you don't have it. Apply and receive credit on a credit card that will pay for your rooms so you can have your vacation. Our current U.S. culture says bigger, better, faster, more. See, the problem with living this way is that it leads us to all kinds of material and spiritual bondage. And and, and let me be honest with you. That's very difficult to break free from. And let's all remember Jesus talks more about money and possessions than he talks about heaven and hell combined. Not because he wants our money. Everyone hear that? Jesus doesn't want our money, but because money is in direct competition with God for access to our hearts. And all of that leads to our first thought this morning. Jesus says, choose a master. Choose a master. Matthew 6, 24 says this, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, there is no better example of Jesus' words written here than the challenges that come with a person trying to follow or live on a diet and a healthy living plan. See, when it comes to following a diet, many people do not understand that a diet without exercise and physical activity will not be successful. Or exercise 
without a healthy diet will not produce the results that many people are looking for. For example, a person cannot go out and run a 5K in the morning, which will burn anywhere from four to 500 calories, and then choose to go out and have Mexican for dinner and indulge in endless chips and salsa, throw in some guac, a margarita to share to go along with a burrito, rice, beans, and fried rice. Ice cream, sorry, for dessert. Fried rice. I guess you could have fried rice for dessert, but ice cream would be better. Just because that person ran a 5K in the morning does not mean they're losing weight. Why? Because they've taken in too many calories at dinner. And because their loyalties were split, they had to choose between which was their master, right? Who were they going to serve? Was it their stomach or was it their health? And that is what Jesus is trying to get us to see about money. We can't serve two masters. We can't love money and love God at the same time. Why? Because money and Jesus, they're striving for our hearts. Both want the number one spot. And all of us, every single one of us sitting in here, can discover where our hearts are by simply looking at where our loyalties and our priorities are spent. Remember Jesus' words. No one can serve two masters. You'll hate one and love the other. Devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And and why is this such a struggle for us? Because we live in a fast-paced smartphone culture. I truly believe that all of us gathered here this morning want to do what's right. We want to love Jesus, and we want to prioritize the kingdom of God. But see, here's the problem. Suddenly, later this afternoon, we could be scrolling through social media, and suddenly on our feed is that pair of shoes that we talked about earlier in the day. And that, and that pair of shoes appears in an ad inviting us to purchase. Or we see that place that we want to take our family to, and it's inviting us with this great deal all on our smartphone. Why is that? Newsflash, our smartphones and Alexa listen to us. And not only do they listen to us, But advertisers then use that to turn it around and invite us to what? Indulge. They invite us to indulge, to spend, just like that Mexican dinner. It doesn't matter what you did earlier. It's all about what you're doing now. And see, friends, we wrestle every day with what the Bible refers to as the spirit of mammon. And and you think, the spirit of mammon? Wait a minute, Chris. I didn't hear that. Well, when Jesus was talking about the love of money and and wanting to be consumed by money. In the New King James Version, it references that as the spirit of mammon. Now, mammon in Hebrew means money or riches. And and it comes from the Syrian god of riches. See, Jesus wasn't simply referring to money when when he was sharing this teaching. He was actually referring to a false god that the people were very familiar with that he was speaking to. The Syrians had a god called Mammon, and it was the god of riches. Mammon actually has its roots in Babylonian history, and it means sown in confusion. See, see, Babylon came from the Tower of Babel, and if you know anything about the story in the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel was a system where the people believed they didn't need God. See, they believed that their own work could get them high enough to reach heaven. And see, when the spirit of mammon influences us, we believe we don't need God if we have enough money. See, the spirit of mammon is an arrogant, prideful spirit that tries to replace God. And and Jesus says, you can't serve God and money or mammon. In other words, money or mammon wants us to look to it and not God. And Jesus is challenging us this morning, friends. Where do your loyalties lie? Mammon or money tries to take God's place by promising us everything that only God can give. And as followers of Jesus living in America, hear this, we are in danger of being influenced more by the spirit of mammon than from Jesus because God and Jesus is being stripped from our culture. Matthew 6, 21 says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, 
where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. See, don't allow your heart to follow money or the spirit of man, because if it does, it leads us to our next thought. See, greed overcomes need. Greed overcomes need. Andy Stanley puts it this way. He says, greed is the assumption it's all for my consumption. Greed is the assumption we assume that we can just consume everything. In other words, greed overcomes need because we have the desire for more things than we actually need. Purchasing stuff is so easy now. Right with a simple click, we can have it delivered in two days, which of course is free shipping because we have Amazon Prime. And this is why Americans, hear me out, are currently drowning in credit card debt. They're trying to sustain lifestyles that are simply unattainable. And that behavior is built on the premise that anything we make or earn should be spent as fast as possible. It comes in, it goes out. And then you may be in the other camp because there's that group of people that that hit the other side of the equation, which is fear-based. And and you see people living in fear that they're going to lose everything, they're going to lose their money, and instead of spending anything, they hoard it. And, And they may not just hoard money, they may buy stuff and stuff and stuff and hoard it out of fear of losing it. They hoard their money, and it hinders their ability to be generous. They don't give to God. They don't help the poor. Because of what? Because they're afraid of losing it. Paper. And it it doesn't matter which camp you're in. It doesn't matter whether you spend or hoard. Both problems are the same. The spirit of mammon, right, is tempting you and is allowing you to trust God Okay, beyond it. It's it's saying, trust me. You don't need God. This money will replace God. You don't need that Holy Spirit living inside of you. This money is better. So ask yourself today, do you have money or does money have you? Because it's one or the other. And it doesn't matter if you said no, it could still have you. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation or trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. See, friends, Paul writes, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now notice, I said this last week, money is neutral. See, we can do good or bad with money. Money in itself is not evil. The love of money is the root. The greed is the root. In other words... It's what we do with our money, how we spend it or how we don't spend it that makes it evil. Because see, friends, money can be used for temporary pleasures that are here today and gone tomorrow, or money can be used for eternal purposes that further the kingdom of God by seeing people transformed by the good news. See, that choice is ours. Will we meet our needs or fill our greed? It's one or the other, which leads us to our next thought. See, Jesus challenges his followers to be good stewards. Good stewards. Let's look at Luke chapter 16. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful of other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Now, last week, okay, we discussed that very, that very strenuous and, and often not talked about topic that if you're in a relationship with Jesus, we all have something we're supposed to be faithful in walking in. And that's giving financially, right? And I addressed the topic of tithing. And, and, and I said tithing is simply stewarding what belongs to another person. That, that our money doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God who gives it. 
And, and tithing is simply a test so that God sees what we do with our first 10%. And he invites us, not only for us to give, but to test him. And he says, if you give, I'm going to give back. And see, when it comes to God, it's all about the good news. When it comes to God, it's all about his kingdom and, and where people will spend eternity with their creator. I mean, Lauren was sharing that during worship. It's just how much God loves us. And see, financial giving is a spiritual act of being the church, right? We have to realize the church, friends, it's not these four walls. This is just simply a building where we gather. We are the church. Financial giving is a spiritual act of being the church and becoming a part of other people's stories. And that's what so many people miss out on. All oh, the church just wants my money. We, the church, we want to become a part of other people's stories. Stories of being set free. Stories of experiencing life change. Stories of meeting Jesus and becoming son and daughter of God. Spending eternity with him. That's being good stewards of our money. That's allowing God to use us to further his kingdom. Which, which leads us to our action steps. And like I said, today's going to be very practical. And, and I just want to look at three simple action steps of how to handle our finances biblically. Because I believe that if we walk in these three simple steps, we can break the power of, of that spirit called mammon or greed that is so influenced our culture, that so impacts our lives, and it will allow us to trust God with our finances. And then suddenly, we can actually put into practice what is written on our currency in God, we trust. Which leads us to our first step. Friends, we need to plan your spending. Plan your spending. See, when we live by the spirit of money or by the spirit of mammon, we're controlled by it. It tells us what we should do and how it should be spent. Right? Which simply means all of our priorities and our principles are based on our culture rather than Jesus' principles. So, so what I want to do for you this morning, I want to look at a practical example of how most Americans spend their money. So what I did was I got out the money jars, okay, which are simply cookie jars that we're going to make the money jars, okay, and we've labeled three different jars. We got give, we got save, and we got spent, okay? For most Americans, most Americans, we take our money that we earn every week, every other week, or once a month, and we spend it on the basics, right? We got food, we got clothing, we got our house, we got our new car. Oh, wait a minute, we got our new outfit once a month, and we got to download the latest songs, and wait a minute, oh, let's not forget the shoes. And then, for some of you, for some Americans, they have a 401k, or they have some retirement plan through work, which allows them to what? To save. And then anything else that may be left over, you know, you may see a homeless guy in the corner, or you may hear about someone in need, like a single mom that, that needs some food, or, hey, you were at Hub City Vineyard this week, and you thought, man, that sermon was good, and you take what's left, and you give. That's how most Americans live every week. And, and friends, if we live this way, this is what it says. Me first, me second, God and everyone else third. Me first, me second, God and everyone else third. Is that God's best? Because friends, if we live this way, you know what this says to God? This says that we live like this life is all there is. Newsflash. There's an eternity where we're going to spend. And God is challenging us through this series to prioritize where our money goes. Before I met Jesus, listen, this is the way I lived. And, and I'll even take it a step further. There was none of this. And there certainly wasn't any of this. It was all right here. It was all spent. And that's just not God's best. But after I met Jesus, it's about reprioritizing where our money goes. 
And if you want to break free from that spirit, you got to reverse this order. And you say, what do you mean reverse this order? How do we reverse how we spend our money? Well, you got to reprioritize it. And, and it may seem difficult, but all of us have to realize, here's, here's the big thing. We all have to realize we inherited the way we spend our money from our family and from our parents. We were born into it, right? Maybe you grew up in a home where, where one parent was a spender and, and, and one who spent everything and, and accumulated debt and the other parent just let it happen. Maybe you came from a family where we're saving, it just it didn't happen. It just came in and went out. Maybe you grew up poor. And you felt like there was never enough to go around for you, and, there, and you just couldn't have something special. Right? How we relate to money often comes how we were raised as children. It has nothing to do with the Bible. But once we come into a relationship with Jesus, that all has to change. Right? If we want to live in financial freedom, we need to reverse or reprioritize how we view money. After all, Jesus said in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. Hate one, love the other, devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot, and that's a big word, serve God and be enslaved to money. If we want to reverse or reprioritize your money, you got to move the containers. And suddenly, as you reverse or move the containers, God begins to take his rightful place of where he wants to be. Okay? Now, I'm going to say a word that, that's going to cause some of you to cringe. We have to learn to live on a budget. And there it is. <laughs> it's that dreaded B word, right? And some of us, when we hear that B word, immediately, you know what our minds go to? Well, I can't have any fun. Chris, I can't experience life living on a budget. I tend to disagree. Okay? A budget, simply stated, is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went, okay? Now, I did not say that. I don't take credit for it. That is Dave Ramsey, okay? Dave Ramsey, financial peace. We actually happen to have the class going right now, today, two o'clock. This is your last Sunday to become a part of that class. If you want to go through that class, okay, and, and learn how to tell your money where to go, instead of wondering where it went and how you spend it, you can hop in that class today, 2 o'clock, in the A-frame, in the youth room. Oh, I'm sorry, in base camp, okay? There's a new name. Now, I want to challenge all of you that don't believe that a budget is anywhere in the Bible. We see this principle of careful planning throughout the Bible. Listen to Jesus' words again in Luke 14. Don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. See, friends, we, we have to plan our spending and you can't do it without a budget. A budget allows for us to make sure we have enough to live on before we spend everything. A budget helps us to track what I earn. And, and what I earn means what money is coming in. How do I make an income? It tracks what I owe, which is obviously our debt, what we're paying out. And finally, it tracks where it all goes. How much we're spending on our food, on, on, on our gas, on our resources. A budget simply tells our money where to go instead, again, of wondering where it went. And if we don't have a budget... This is where those marketers whisper in our ears, which leads to that impulse buying, right? And that extra spending. And, and that's just a bad habit. The only way to avoid impulse buying is to live on a budget. Because if we fail to have a plan, then you're planning to fail. And, and, and I believe living on a budget is a simple act of faith. It's a step of faith. You're simply saying to God, I'm going to live according to the limits that you set for me. And I'm going to trust that you're going to bless me with every step that I take. Right? If we want to trust in God rather than money, then you have to understand the first step is to plan our spending, is to tell it where to go, which leads to our next step. You have to save faithfully. 
Save money faithfully. Now, listen to this. It's going to blow your mind. Did you know, on average, most Europeans save 18% of their income? Most Japanese people save 20 to 25% of their income. Anyone want to shout out and guess how much Americans save? Let me hear it. 2%, 5%, 1%. How about this? Everybody ready? Americans overspend 1% of their income on average. When you take all the Americans together and you put them all together and you shake them up, it comes out that they overspend by 1%. And you're like, well, Chris, why? Because what's our culture tell us? Bigger is better. Got to have it right now. Got to have it. And there's a lot of people that are currently hitting retirement and have nothing in their savings. They have nothing to plan with. Proverbs tells us this in Proverbs 13. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Proverbs 10. Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. A wise youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. See, friends, we have to choose to save. Little by little. And, and, and I promise If we start saving now, we will be so much further ahead, regardless of your current age. Because so many people say, well, I'm too old to start saving. Fool. It doesn't matter if you're in your teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. I don't care if you're in your 50s. It's never too late to start saving. It has to become a priority. And and the good thing about saving, it, it actually works on your behalf. You can be asleep And there's interest occurring on your savings. Your money actually is working for you while you're asleep. And the guiding principle for savings is this. Remember, reverse the script. The guiding principle for savings is 10% to God, the tithe, 10% to savings, live on 80%. 10, 10, 80. And for some of you, you're like, there's no way. <laughs> what do you mean 10, 10? That math doesn't work in my, in my income. And I get it. When I was preparing this talk, I began to look at our finances, look in the mirror, and Jess and I were like, well, we need to begin to make some changes. Because this is your check engine light when it comes to your financial world. If you're not able to prioritize 10, 10, and 80, then there's a check engine light that's saying you are overspending. You are not allowing yourself margins where you can give back. And you've got to be honest with yourself. And more importantly, you've got to be honest with God. Because, friends, that is what is best for our lives. Okay? We have to choose to do what is right. Hebrews 13, 5 says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. I mean, just last week when I was sharing that testimony, I mean, uh, uh, outline and talk about tithing, Mike Gamby came up to me afterwards. He goes, I, you know, I just got this incredible ter- testimony I want to share with the church. And, and we didn't have really time to record it, but I said, just tell it to me. And he goes, you know, I was in a crisis in my life. My wife and I were not in a good place. We, we had split up, we, and, and, we were, and I was making really bad choices financially. And in those bad choices financially, I stopped tithing. I stopped giving. And I'll never forget the Sunday I went, to a, I went to church and I felt the Holy Spirit whisper and tell me to start giving. At which point I looked back and I said, God, I can't tithe. Mike said, I can't tithe. I, I, I don't have the money, extra money to give back. He said, and he felt like the Holy Spirit said, start somewhere. So he took a $100 bill out of his pocket and put it in the offering box. And that $100 bill was anywhere from 4 to 5%. But he said that simple act of faith started him on a journey where he reprioritized, reorganized his spending so that finances now don't control him. He may have started at 4 or 5%, that grew to 7%, that grew to 9%, that grew to 10%, and now is well up into 12, 13, and 14% because he has margins to bless others. So here's the point. It's all about prioritizing and making a choice. You have to plan how you spend, you have to save. And finally, step three, you got to act your wage. Now, the good thing about this point 
is you're going to remember this point and take it from here. It's not act your age. It's act your wage. And we have to understand that this point is countercultural to our current society because we are constantly waging against the machine. The machine is constantly telling us to buy, 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 to live above our means and, and, and to spend everything we have. That's the American way. To consume. And if you don't have it, put it on credit. Friends, that's not God's best. Look, look at Luke 69. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others, to make friends. Then when your possessions are growing, they will welcome you into an eternal home. Proverbs 21. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. See, imagine, friends, trying to live on 110% of your income. It's not possible. You're, you're broke because you're taking all your extra money. You're constantly spending. You're taking on other jobs. You're, you're trying to pay off debt. And you know what's left over? This is what's left over. Coins to put in the homeless man's bucket. And those coins, though they may help him a little bit, they don't allow you to have margins to truly bless others. They don't allow you to hear about a single mom who can't pay her rent and you step in and make a difference. They don't allow you the opportunities to, to, to bless your children, to bless other people, and to live a generous life. Margins allow us to live generously. We, we don't have to drop a few coins in. We can be generous. For example, some of you don't know this, but we have teenagers on a youth retreat this weekend. Some of you, you are living with margins, and, and you paid for their trip to that youth retreat. Thank you, because you're generous and you have margins, right? Some of you paid for people to take Financial Peace University because you believe in the class, you believe that it changes lives. Here's the reality. You're living with margins, and you're able to bless others. Just this week, some of you don't know it, we're, we're trying to build wells in third world countries as a Christmas gift to the poor this, this Christmas, which is a good thing, right? So Jess comes to me, she goes, she goes, Chris, how much are we giving to the wells this year since we're collecting this offering? I said, I don't know, I haven't really prayed about it. She goes, well, let's pray about it because I'm going to come up with a sum and I want it to come out of our check every single week before we even get paid. And I said, oh, so you want to give a lot? <laughs> she goes, yeah, we want to take it out. See, our tithe comes out of our pay before we even get paid so that we can have our tithe come out, our wells come out, and then we give well above and beyond our 10% because we desire to be generous. Now, hear me out. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, Chris, this is impossible. You know, for, for me to go 10% and 10% and live on 80 that seems like a mountain I need to climb. But I want to challenge you with this. And I shared it last week. I believe God says, test him. That if you begin to reprioritize and reorganize your life and prioritize your finances and putting God first, and you choose generosity, you will defeat the spirit of mammon and the love of money that is rampant in our society. And it's going to change lives, not only your family's life, not only your kid's life, but it's going to impact others in this tri-state area because the good news is being preached. And that is something you will never, ever regret. So this morning, I want to ask you something. Which step do you need to focus on? And I want to challenge you this afternoon when you go home. I want you to get with your spouse. And if, you don't, if you're not married and you're single, look in the mirror. Do you need to better plan your spending? Do you need to go home and look in the mirror or talk to your, or talk to your spouse about how, how you need to save and you need to make that a priority? Do you, do you need to go home and talk to your spouse and, 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 and look in the mirror if you're not married and say, hey, am I acting my wage? Am I allowing my money and telling it where to go so it can make a difference? Listen, I've been preparing this talk all week and God has been challenging me about the different areas in my own life that I need to work on and change. And Jess and I are prioritizing and making it a reality because it's important. Luke 16, 10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. God is inviting us, listen, to join him in furthering his kingdom right here on earth. Now I invited Rhett to come up 
and to close in worship. And this is the reason why. Quite often in churches and in our life, we separate God and money, right? We put them in their own little buckets. Well, God, God's here, church, HDV, money's over here, and we want to separate it. But I was convicted this week. Guess what? We, we can't separate it anymore. It, it's one because where our heart is, right, that's where we're going to follow. And, and I just felt compelled that we need to close in worship, that we need to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we close so that we can together become generous people. Amen? So let's stand together. And I will invite you to sing out and invite the Holy Spirit to reveal to you any areas that you may need to tweak or change when it comes to this area of finances. What do you need to reprioritize? Let's sing together. I know you're proud of me. Yes, God. Even though I don't deserve it sometimes. No, I'm not a perfect child. I still make my father smile. And I know you're proud of me. Take me just as I am You would choose me all over again Cause I am the one you love I am the one you love I don't have to prove anything There's room at your table for me God, I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful for each and every person that's here, God. Come, Holy Spirit. I just pray you would silence the distractions in Jesus' name. And God, I just pray for a release of your generosity into each and every person that's gathered here, that we would become a generous people focused on you, prioritizing you, and that, God, we would see your kingdom furthered here in the tri-state area. In Jesus' name. And listen, if you're here this morning and you're distracted and you're focused on getting attention from others rather than God, maybe you've walked away from God and you haven't started that relationship yet. Today's your day. I just want to invite you, if that's you, that you would just pray this prayer with all of us. Jesus, I'm broken. I'm full of doubt, shame, regret, sin. Change me. I believe you're God's son. I believe you died for me. Make me new. Set me free. Allow me to serve others. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that for the first time, be sure to text me this week so I can reach out and follow up with you about next steps and how to start that journey. And listen, if you need prayer for anything else, finances, health, you got an injury, you're struggling with your mental status, our prayer team will be over here on my right to pray with you individually, one-on-one, just simply journey over here. And we'll find you and pray with you. 
And as we close, let's sing together these verses one more time as we move forward and become a generous people. We ask that you would rest on us. God, we ask that you would go behind us. Just surround us in every way, every aspect. God, allow us to be the light in the darkness this week. Allow us to walk with a purpose. Allow us to be the reason why someone does not give up. You are worthy of our praise, and we love you. In Jesus' name, we all said together. Amen. God bless you, Hub City. Have an incredible rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next week. Hey, friends. Thank you for joining us online at the Hub City Vineyard. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our community of faith, simply visit hcv.church. The best way to stay connected with us is to simply subscribe to our channel. I want to encourage you, if God spoke to you today through this talk, share it with all your friends. See you next time you visit us at the Hub City Vineyard.